I had a chance to speak with Darren Scott outside of this interview. Uh, got along with him very well. He takes a very different and unique approach to Moroni and an LDS film, so to speak. I think you'll find the interview very interesting. We talk about culture. We talk about approaches artistically to the subject matter of the scriptures, etc. Before we get into this, though, I want to talk about my sponsor, Scripture Notes. If you guys have heard me talk about this, but you have not yet gone and tried Scripture Notes, go check that out now. Go to scripturenotes.com, scripturenotes.com, and check out the ability to increase your study. For those that have tried it over and over again, I get messages back saying this really is a big difference. The features, the links, and just, again, the ability to flow through the scriptures is really quite unique. Go to scripturenotes.com. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we have writer, director, and actor of the movie Oath currently out in theaters, Darren Scott. Darren, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Greg. Darren, I want to start off by asking you about getting into filmmaking. What is it that brought you into Hollywood and the idea of, hey, I want to, I want to be an actor? Yeah, I started acting in junior high, actually. I started in, in theater. And uh, I was always kind of a ham. Even before I did that, I, I remember perfecting the art of running into a door and, and freaking my mom out that I had like broken my face. I was very good at it. Uh, and then I, I got into to plays in junior high and I, I was just kind of a ham. I was kind of a ham in class too. And that's kind of where it started. And then I had a, a very dramatic spiritual change when I was a junior in high school. It was, uh, I guess I was 16 and uh, I, I, you know, I, it was a very dramatic thing and it, it involved burning clothes and music, you know, physical CDs and stuff that tapes even mm -hmm. back in the day of tapes, because I, I was showing the Lord that I wasn't going to, that I was going to do his work. Mm -hmm. It was, it, I was kind of an interesting kid. And, and then I started collecting movie soundtracks because I, gravitated toward or orchestral music and specifically music written for film is written to evoke emotions and i really loved just basking in those emotions um at a very yeah, you, think, you know yeah. one thing i know I, I i do the same thing i love i love soundtracks it seems all the talent you know i, I was gonna say anciently but you know hundreds of years ago you've got the symphony and you've got the opera and theater etc but it seems like the in our day and age that all of that talent has gone to the theater, the, the musical talent in that sense. In other words, there's not a lot, I don't know that there's a lot more uh, classical music that's being produced, but yeah. it's, but there's, there's a lot of soundtracks being produced. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Yeah. I, I've always been fascinated. So I, theater wasn't enough for me. I, I wanted to take kind of the, it's not that the theater is very authentic. It's just, it's a different art form where you, you um, in movies, it's, it's more of an intimacy that takes place. You know, sometimes the camera's like two feet from your face, you know? And, and so you don't have to be as big as you are on stage. So there's that kind of a realness to film that, that I really gravitated toward. Um, and that, that's kind of what drew me into movies was that, that music aspect and, and, you know, the, the power of, of, a cinematic experience that could change someone for better and or for worse right like it's it's both and i was fascinated with the idea of being able to inspire others through through cinema and through movies and uh i i mean i think it would be hard to disagree that that it is the most powerful influence on the earth right now is is the visual and the amount of p hours i mean the average statistic is like 7 to 8 hours a day is is how much people spend watching things and so when you take that into account and you go okay i want to i want to try to influence the world for good well movies is a good place to do that and so you know, that fascinated me. And of course, my my draw and, um, you know, life study of the Book of Mormon 
also in, in, you know, the heroic stories that hail from that record, they inspired me. And it, so it was just kind of like this mesh combination of, I want to be involved in film and I want to portray these specific stories, you know, among other things. Um, there was a few things that inspired me more than, than uh, those heroic stories of, you know, heroes that maintained their honor in dishonorable times. That's very fascinating to me. Not only that, but they were able to um, surprisingly and almost like uh, confoundingly, they were able to attain kind of a, not, not that this is what you seek, but they were able to attain the favor of an unrighteous people, even though they themselves were godly. Hmm. That's fascinated me that, that Mormon was able to do that. Moroni was able to do that. Captain Moroni was able to do that. Um, you know, how are these people able to gain the favor? Because even when the people were just debaucherous and they're completely wicked and, you know, horrible, horrible, uh, committing acts of ho horrible abomination, they yet wanted, you know, Mormon to lead their armies. And that's just always just fascinated me that even when a people is teetering, to, toward their own, you know, suicide, they wanted this righteous spiritual leader. It's always fascinated me. I'm like, how did he do that? How was he able to do that? And, you know, I think in it's, it's admittedly a, kind of a fantasy of mine. I, I, I would love to be able to, um, I want to be able to maintain my honor, you know, mm -hmm. in today. And I, and I want to inspire others to do the same. And I think there's there's power in groups. There's power in unity of of minds and hearts of of trying to just do the right thing and and be better. So that's what inspired me to get into it. Really, I mean, because it's a not it's, you know it's it's not it, Hollywood's a kind of a, it's a tough it's, gig. It's crazy business. Yeah, it's like uh, there's a lot of just bad things that happen in Hollywood. I mean, we're starting to hear about the Me Too movement and all this stuff. I mean, that's been going on for years. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. So did you ever figure out what it was? What did Mormon and Moroni have? How did they do it? I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that out. I, I think one of the things that people generally look up to is when someone is willing to speak the truth against all odds and at any cost that they're willing to stake their lives on truth. And I think even people who are not living in truth, like secretly there's this admiration for that. Mm -hmm. And almost like they try to almost mimic that courage in their causes and movements, but their causes and movements are hollow because they're not based on truth. Mm -hmm. and so I think that that's part of the reason that they mm -hmm. just they were respected as 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 men of honor that would um, keep their oaths and that they could accomplish miraculous things because they saw them accomplish these things i mean that's why they wanted them right is because they would be in these battles these herculean battles that uh, there was no possible way to win and yet uh, mormon and moroni they were able to lead their armies to victory that does something, you know, to uh, to an army of people who are following you. They're like, I want that guy. You know, even if I'm not living the way he's living, if we've got him at our head, we can win. And that says that in the scriptures that they looked to him as a leader who could deliver them. So now for yourself, how did you break into this? I mean, you're a ham and you've got you got your soundtracks, but how do you actually break into Hollywood? I was pulling up your IMDb profile and. So you've been in a number of Latter-day Saint uh, films and you've got uh, The Witnesses and Joseph Smith's story and you've played a number of different characters. I think you were in uh, a, a movie that, or, or a series that I watch also, Yellowstone, an episode in Yellowstone. And how do, how do you break into this? How do you, how do you say, OK, I'm a Latter-day Saint. I want to uphold my honor, but I want to go out into this world. And how did you break into that? It's you got to be able to just throw yourself in and sometimes work for free uh if it if it 
if it involves, you know, a, a, a production that is worth the experience of gaining. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like you mop the floors on Yellowstone if you have to. I didn't do that, but um, or a Disney film or, you know, some big studios, you're going to get very good experience. Um, so, you know, there's a there's a lot of that where you just are going for it. Um, and then, of course, you need to get an agent. It's uh, not really possible to to do it without an agent. So I, I got an agent early on. I had just returned from living in El Salvador for two years on my mission. And it was a couple of years back and I got an agent and it was like four months after I got my agent, I booked my first Disney film, uh, TV film. And then, uh, and then uh, the year after that, I booked my next Disney film. And then the third year, I almost booked another Disney film, but I, I was actually getting to that point where I couldn't play the teenage high school guy anymore because I was like 26. Um, and so I, I didn't get that. I remember specifically the, the director said, now, how, how old are you? <laughs> and uh, I've learned since that the answer to that question is, how old do you think I am? <laughs> unfortunately, I was too honest and told him my age. And so I didn't get the part because it affected him. Um, his casting decision but so then that's how i started and then i got on like a discovery channel show and then i booked a you know independent king alfred movie and that's where i just love the kind of historical um fiction kind of uh, or even based on truth history i love that time of holding swords and wearing armor that's where it kind of started for me and then yeah and just just you know it's off and on um you know, so it's you're hoping to book a couple couple films a year, a couple gigs a year is 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 pretty good in this business. So mm -hmm. over the years, I've you know booked several things, and you know one of the recent things was the Yellowstone gig. So with Kevin Costner, that was fun. Um, so yeah, it's a it's not a business for the faint of heart. I'll tell you that. Um, and and you know you have to have kind of your hand in a lot of things to to be able to pursue it. Um, but I think, you know, for the most part, and, and if this isn't the case, you know, people find themselves chewed up and spit out pretty quickly in this business, unless you are doing it for passion. And because there's just so much that comes at you in the business that that would tell you to turn around and go somewhere else, you know. And so you really have to do it for the passion. And um, yeah, I've, I've certainly tried to do that. So moving beyond that, you know, acting is one thing, but going out and actually creating a film is something completely different. I mean, you've got to pull yeah. everything together yourself. You wrote the story for the oath. Uh, you of course, you've got the casting. You've got bringing all of the things that are involved in filmmaking here. That just sounds like an overwhelming. Uh, I, I know you had put together a short, something similar to what the oath is before. Yeah. And then you built off of that, it looks like, for the oath. But that's. Did that short that you kind of that short film did that give you kind of a little bit more of the experience of what you needed to do in order to uh, to put this together? Absolutely, yeah. The short film, the short film was filmed in three days, and it was essentially doing the same thing that that I did on the oath, uh, but it was concentrated in that three day time. And had we had we continued that pace past the three days, we would have killed everybody. It was not possible. So for the oath, we had to like ratchet it down a little bit, but not much. I mean, we still, we filmed the oath in 21 days and yeah, I mean, it really, you have to sit back and think like all those jobs, it's, it's a huge weight. And just the fact that the movie is finished and is as good as it is, um, obviously arguably you can't, you can't please everybody, but we're scoring 85% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, over 500 reviews. So by and large, people really like the movie. And uh, of course, I say that because, you know, there are people who don't like the movie. Um, and so, but the fact that if, if you watch the movie for a movie's sake, and you kind of go into it with, with that mentality, it's it's kind of hard to walk out and say that movie was just terrible and there have been people who have said that but i'm just like man you just totally missed it because and it's interesting because like all of the 
industry professionals and people that I've worked with, even Billy Zane, when he saw it, he was shocked. I mean, he just had no idea it was going to be as good as it was. I mean, he just told me, he's like, you got to be just so proud of this. He's like, this is way, I mean, this is just, you got to be proud of it. It's really good. And he told me that he would sing the praises of this movie, hmm. uh, you know, when he talked to people. Um, and, and there are other people along the way, of course. So um, I invite people to go to oathmovie.com, grab tickets, and watch it for yourself. Any projects that's like this, and you have to just take it this way, you know that any project that has anything to do with, you know, Book of Mormon, or you know LDS themed, but, but especially the Crown Jewel Book of Mormon, you can guarantee that it's going to be polarizing on both sides. You're going to have the people who are the one star people, and you're going to have the people that are the five star people. And um, IMDb, for example, is it's kind of a cesspool that you can't really verify any reviews. You can literally anyone can just go on and click one star and just hate a movie. They haven't seen the movie. You know, they have no desire to see the movie. They just want to hate on it. And that's kind of what's happened on IMDb. So we got a much lower rating there. Um, but, you know, even on IMDb, if you look at it, it's like a U shape, one star, 10 star. And there's really no in between. And so you owe it, people owe it to themselves to go look at it for themselves. I mean, this was a 13 year journey in the making. And, um, and the movie doesn't stink. It's not a bad movie. It's actually a really good movie. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I invite people to do that. I've, I've, I've had, um, we, we've been able to go to many of the screenings, um, kind of, you know, encouraging people. And we've, we've gone to several sold out shows, um, and met with people after the show. And, you know, I've, I've, I still remember like, tears from grown men on on my face hugging them that lingered on my face after they left and it's like look you get that experience and then you get the people who are just tearing it to shreds and it's like well which one is it go see right. for yourself and uh i dare say that you know if if you're if you're kind of in that shallow land where you like the shallow movie you're not going to like this movie this movie is a very thought provoking deep movie and if you go into it with a light attitude, you're not going to get it. And and uh, and and those are the people who do get it. Those are the people who come out and they're just like changed. Their lives are changed from watching it. It's because they've they've gone in with that attitude that you know instead of looking for every little thing to critique because you can do that with any movie, right? Um, instead of doing that, just kind of let yourself fall into it. You have a really great experience. Uh, a couple of things I really liked about the movie was, um, number one, it is not a traditional Book of Mormon movie. This is not something where you're trying to tell the story word by word is what you're getting in, in the Book of Mormon. You're adding something in. And, and something I really appreciate is, you know, if you go back to the Old Testament, for example, you have these prophets that are they're almost more personable to me than what I see in the book of Mormon at times, right? There's, there's yeah. in the book of Mormon. It's very much held up these, you know, outside of maybe an Alma, the younger you have, you have these prophets that are held up, but they're the human side of them is not there usually, right? It, it it's not the point of what the book is. And you seem to try to do that with Moroni is make him much more of this human that is like we are. Right. I mean, he's, he's, I, I see him and I say, oh, yeah, this is someone more like what I would be. I, that's something I appreciate about the Old Testament prophets. I feel like, oh, I could, this, they're a little more real to me. And so you kind of mold this, this character of Moroni about with this real, uh, this realism that says, look, this is a guy that is going to go through an, un, he has an unbelievable responsibility that he's trying to carry out. And, and he's got the pressure of what he's trying to do and he's alone. And, um, how, did you, did you, have you thought about that a lot? I'm guessing about what is your, you were talking about the honor of, of how these men lived and, but you must've really tried to get into Moroni's head here and say, well, what would this be like taking a few verses about him being alone with this incredible, 
responsibility at, of, of creating this, you know, sealing up this record for, for later. What you spent a lot, I'm guessing you spent a lot of time trying to get into his head. Moroni is not a statue. And I think that there is a, a good amount in the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, I just say the people, the members of the church, there is a fair amount of kind of deification of these human beings. Yes, they were prophets. They were holy men. But even holy men are not perfect men. And they're not, you know, gods in the flesh. And so, you know, the only person that was that was, was Jesus Christ. And, you know, interestingly enough, Jesus Christ was so controversial that he was crucified because he was doing things out of the box. All right. So we have to take lessons from the past and go, man, if I was in Jesus time, would I would, would I have crucified him? Because he wasn't following the rules because he wasn't, he was like, he was trying to teach people a higher way. And they were so caught up in the rules and the, in the myopic pharisaical thinking that they, they just couldn't have him exist. And so these people crucified their God. And, you know, we read in the scriptures that it'll be many days and many, many in the, in the judgment day that will say, Lord, Lord, did I not, did we not like, cast out devils and preach. It's like, if, if all of us aren't looking at ourselves and going, dude, is that going to be me? You know, and, and I, I'm constantly living my life that way. I'm constantly like my motto. I've said this at nauseum to everyone who knows me. No one is immune. No one is immune to fall, to, um, to, to be led astray. And I think the number one thing we have to, we have to first base ourselves on is like, you know, we don't know very much. I'm not going to say I know everything about history, about Jesus, about Moroni, about the scriptures. You know, as soon as we say that, that's that's the, 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 the precipice of falling off the cliff when you think that you know everything. And so we fall into this trap like, well, that's not what Moroni was like. That's not what he did or that's invented. And um, yes, there was there were some, you know, um, creative liberties that were that, that were taken necessarily um in in the in the making of this movie and frankly as anyone who knows the book of mormon back and forward knows that if the book of mormon was portrayed literally without any creative liberties it would be rated r there's no question the book of ether would be game of thrones hmm. like with with no with you know no censoring like that it would be game of thrones that's what it is and so you know what's what makes the book of mormon so absolutely fascinating is that even though all of that is in the book, it mentions Jesus Christ or refers to him almost 4,000 times. The closest of the Bible is 1,700. I mean, there hasn't been like a literal that I could find, but that was the closest estimation that I could come to. And so you have this book that has these, you know, crazy things in it, but then it, it's also so Christ-centered and Christ-soaked that this just makes it just so fascinating. Again, going back to this hero in these heroes in dishonorable times. And that's, that's literally the book of Mormon and, and how Jesus is in it, the savior. Uh, but um, all these other things are in it. So um, we really try to humanize Moroni and, and, and feel those uh, challenges that he faced and even the creative liberties that were taken. I mean, they weren't necessarily just created out of whole cloth. I mean, there's, you know, Moroni said he was alone and that he had no kindred. You know, when did he say that? And isn't it possible that after he wrote those words, which, by the way, on plates, we know, because Jacob tells us this, I think it was in the book of Jacob, that which we write must remain. And so whatever was recorded on the plates, there's not an eraser, which is, again, why they had to be so careful with what they wrote and how they wrote it. So he writes those words. Is it possible that he could have, you know, had a run in with a person or two um, in that time? And, and wouldn't it be just a, a wonderful mercy 
even to imagine that he he got to experience you know divine companionship righteous companionship um be again before he left the earth there's a uh, one scripture or one one verse where he's talking about as he's sealing up the record and and by the way i mean you mentioned kind of his un unbelievable task that he had all of the records from all the generations compiled in this one book and he is the keeper of this book like the task was monumental to to finish the record to to protect the record and to hide it up unto the lord was just insurmountable and he did it and um but one of the verses he says is i seal up this record after i have spoken a few words and that verse always struck me because if he's writing, who is he speaking to? Like, do you, or, or did he just use the wrong word? I seal up this record after I have written a few things. He said, after I have spoken a few things. So you start to go like, who's he talking to? And that actually gave me a little bit of like, well, maybe he was talking to somebody. There's several scenes that were removed from this movie in, uh, that, you know, every movie goes through this, the, the, the refining process. And one of those scenes, it's just one of beautiful scene. One of them was the, the, the plates repository where he walks through and there's these shiny plates. It's so great. And um, another one is another couple of scenes is where uh, Bathsheba actually was helping him record. He mm -hmm. taught her how to do it after she made the covenants as well. And he knew that he didn't have to, you know, you know, fear from her breaking an oath that, she helped him and that, that was removed from the movie. But um, again, that kind of comes from that verse is, is kind of like a, and, and even look, is it so hard to believe? Like even Joseph Smith had a, had a, had a scribe, you know, like he's dictating to someone who's writing. Right. So like, is this so hard to believe that, that could have well, happened? Even Emma's involved with that for a time. Exactly. So, you know, I, I think we just, we get, we get this, tra it's a trap. It really is a trap that we get into this, it cannot be another way. And, um, and, and frankly, I mean, I think yours is kind of a podcast where you can talk about these things. You know, the, the, the word cult didn't exist in Joseph Smith's time. If you go back to the Webster dictionary, which is the only dictionary I pretty much trust anymore <laughs> from the 1800s, uh, I think it was 18 or I remember. Um, it, it's the older one. It's 1800 something. And cult, cult does not exist. <clears throat> Cult came uh, in, in, in more modern times to try to kind of deride our religion, our faith, and, and, and other faiths that they have deemed as cults. Uh, but interestingly enough, cult exists as, as part of the word culture. And I think that um, we as Latter-day Saints have a tendency um, to, to fall into the culture of, of, uh, of, our, of the church. And it's it's actually not the gospel. It's it's a different thing, mm -hmm. and um, and so anyway, yes, you you said that this is unlike any Book of Mormon movie that's ever been released, and you you're absolutely right. And it it actually challenges that very thing. It's it's the talk that Jeffrey R. Holland gave um, years ago at BYU, where he was when he was president, and he was talking about the third chapter of Nephi. And he's literally decapitating Laban. And, and he says, why? Even the most casual reader will find it in that page. And then he says, and has to deal with it. That that one lesson that was so critical um, that, that Nephi had to learn that was going to forge him for the journey that was ahead is that he had he had to learn that he had to do something that he'd never done before and that he shrunk before because he had never shed the blood of a man. I, I, I hope that all of your listeners will take even just five minutes and just think about it for a second. You've got a man, a very powerful man laying before you who is, you know, incapacitated for his drunkenness and the spirit of the Lord tells you to, to decapitate him. Think about that. And you've never shed, this was before all the wars, right? So he had never shed blood. 
and in that sense, he was a very innocent man. And, and I mean, he was like, this is not something he would do. And, and yet the spirit of the Lord was telling him to do that. And uh, I think that's kind of, it's, it's analogous to life. I think the Lord constantly wants to show us more and he can't show us more because we're only willing to accept this and we have to get out. And that is exactly what the oath does it, for, for anyone who's ready for it, the, the oath. And if you're not ready for it, you usually come out of the movie like, whoa, I didn't like this and I didn't like that. You missed the whole thing. If you go into it and you let yourself go, you're going to have an unbelievable experience. And it, it is a movie that makes you think. And it makes you think about these things and it, it humanizes Moroni. It makes you feel his loneliness. It makes you feel the, the agony he must have felt of, you know, being alone for so long. And, and it makes you feel the, the conviction he had to, to keep his oaths above all cost and to finish his mission, which he did. You know, glory to God, he finished his mission and he buried those plates. And we have them now in the form of the Book of Mormon. Um, and it, it, this movie really, really takes you through that journey. And, you know, what a wonderful thing because we read these scriptures and so much so many times we just we just don't quite feel that and that's the power of movies is it allows you to kind of bring that in and bring it to life and i believe i believe that part of the the prophecy that it shall be as if one spoke from the dead i believe that that is talking specifically about cinema how do people get resurrected today how do people get immortalized today through movies and it's usually after people die right they die and then they do the biopic pick and we've got all these you know the michael jacksons and you know all the people that are making these and i believe that's what's happening and what's going to continue to happen i i hope to god continues to happen for the people in the book of mormon um so yeah we really try to make it real and authentic so yeah that was a great part of it. I another thing that was interesting is that because of the woman Bathsheba that's involved, you also have the Lamanites then involved with what is going on there at the end, right? And and, and yeah. you see, it's always been you go through the Book of Mormon and there's always that friction, obviously, that's there. Mostly the dissenters actually that are riling up the Lamanites against against the Nephites. But uh, here at the end, you've got that bringing together in a sense. Right between Bathsheba and and Moroni, and that is the desire of the prophets in the Book of Mormon the entire time. Exactly, it is to, they they're they're willing to sacrifice themselves. They're willing to give up. Unlike sometimes the Nephites as a whole were, were willing to do, you know. But but the the prophets wanted. They knew that they needed to to reach out to the Lamanites, and and it, despite the fact that they hated them, and they never lost hope. They never lost hope. You're right. Lost hope. Of and course, they had the visions of Nephi and Lehi, and true. they see these things there. But you're right. They never lost hope. So, and, and then you think about the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph and the, the pulling together of these things. And so that that to me, as I'm watching that, I see that kind of that pulling together toward the end there, where uh, uh, the, the plates are, are are going to be are going to be buried. You had uh, quite a few references in the movie to. Uh, you know, a little bit of artistic license on things like seals and, and, and uh, I, I don't want to call them pictures or there's a papyrus that is unrolled. There are a scroll that has uh, images on it that are very interesting. And they begin to, there's a scene where they're talking about all the prophets of, of the book of Mormon, as if it's like this pictograph for Moroni to look through that. Uh, I don't know if Mor Mormon had created, I think he had, but uh Kind of like, okay, here is the story of the Book of Mormon in there. Is that from you? Did you have any other advisors for the Book of Mormon that you were working with on this? Or did you kind of take your own study and, and insert it into the movie? Yeah, I have you know, advisors and friends. Um, I, for the most part, in both the script and everything that came out of it, um, you know, or on onto the page and then onto the screen, I... I'm very hesitant to read books of books. 
in a case of where it's the Book of Mormon, because anytime you're reading a book about the Book of Mormon, you you, inev you inevitably have someone else's like human opinion inserted in some way. And so I really try to take it directly from the source material. Um, even, I mean, believe it or not, even with, you know, uh, the, you know, fictitious elements that, that were kind of weaved in to it, uh, again, I mentioned the thing about Bathsheba and, and it not being invented out of out of thin air. Um, I, I believe from from my studies of the Book of Mormon that Captain Moroni, for example, is is uh, kind of a, a guardian of of the promised land in in many sense. And so we kind of portray him as a as a kind of spectral warrior that that kind of appears throughout the film to aid in critical points of the journey. And um, that also, you know, just I'm not creating that out of thin air. For example, um, you know, the, the ending scene, that's also not created out of thin air because it's like we have record and scriptures of that happening with other prophets. And I'm, you notice I'm being very vague here because I don't want to drop any spoilers for people. Um, but yeah, so I um, really try to stick to the record. And and as far as the um, the... This is this is part of the the miracle of all of this, and geez, I just don't know why people don't talk more about this. We had like seventy plus people involved in this show from start to finish, and only three of them were members of the church. Hmm. And so, it's amazing to me that um, her uh, Victoria's her name that that wrote that that created that scroll. I gave her direction. I gave her, okay, this is kind of how I want. I, I want it to have this, you know, chain of prophets and record bearers. You know, I kind of told her the story. This is kind of how I want it to look. Give her some reference pictures. And she created that, you mm -hmm. know, someone who's not of our faith. She created that. And and, and I, I absolutely have no doubt in my mind that she was inspired by God because it's a beautiful thing. And many people have written in and saying, hey, can I get a copy of that? Can I buy it? Mm -hmm. Will you make that available? I mean, it's it's just beautiful. No, it is. No question. And, it, and it's like on a one scroll, it's like the story of the Book of Mormon on one scroll. Mm -hmm. And right at front and center, Jesus Christ at the top. And it's just mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. Um, so we do want to, uh, she's actually sent it to me. Um, she sent it to me and said, hey, have you thought about merchandising this? And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, we have actually. We have people inquire. But, you know, there's a whole thing that goes into merchandising. It's 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 not just like, it, there's a lot of back end where you're mailing. It's just it's it's a big task, and we just want to know that there's enough demand for it. But yeah, um, really, that that scroll actually was supposed to be on the wall. That was one of the things that we had to change just because of expediency and, and moving quickly. And that was a decision we made. Just put it on the scroll, and I think it was a good choice. Um, and then of course you have the the image on uh, Moroni's breastplate which is highly, highly symbolic. And that's actually from the first script that I wrote, um, Reign of Judges, that, that our pilot film was based on. And there's a descriptive scene where Ar Archiantus, uh, which again is a fictitious character in name because his Archiantus is mentioned, but it's a different Archiantus later in the book. And um, in Captain Rona's time, that's the name we gave to his father. And he's explaining kind of the meaning of that symbol and that's the symbol that gets engraved on Moroni's breastplate and uh, on uh, oh, basically uh, um, all the breastplates of the Nephites, uh, which which was also a fascinating time to to. I, and I hope I hope to the Lord that that I'm able to portray that time, too, because what an amazing time where they, you know, Moroni made this armor, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, I likened it to in the script. It was like the Lamanites the first time they saw it. It was like it was like seeing a spaceship. It's like they'd never seen anything like it. In fact, we we read from the record the first time that they saw Moroni's armies, they just turned around and ran because they're like, I don't know what that is glistening, but that that is scary, and uh, you know, and likely so because they just they just got got their tails whooped in that first battle because they didn't have the armor, mm -hmm. and then of course they copied the armor, and um, but yeah, in in the oath, um, there were a lot of things that you know, to, to bring people into that world and help. And again, that's, that's why Bathsheba among other characters was written in is to give the lens through a non-believer 
uh, you know, and and this is this is what you know Hollywood's always done. This is, they they help you to understand this character. They want you to understand, but you know you can't just go out with you know the the stuffy prophet who who never makes a mistake and you know who no one can relate to. People don't want that kind of hero. They can't relate to that kind of hero, and so you have the Bathsheba character bringing that incense where they're able to kind of teach some of that. Like what is in this guy's head? And it helps the audience through the eyes of a non-believer. And in fact, even the people who are believers appreciate that because it helps them even understand Moroni a little better. Um, yeah, yeah, the realism is a very important part of this. And it, it's, it's you know, you're, what, what we're typically accustomed to, I would say trained to in, in the yeah. media within the church is we have this, uh, you know, it's a very buttoned down. Um, you know, they've gotten a little bit better with it, but it's a very buttoned down image of, of these prophets because they've got to be almost Cloroxed, right? In, in the sense that they're purified. It, yeah. What's that? It's sanitized is the word. Sanitized. Yeah, exactly. And so devoid this of is, drama, that's devoid what of, I yeah. liked about this. It was just the opposite. It was like, no, this is a real person going to go through real challenges and immense challenges, and I want to see that. I want to. I want to be able to relate to that character a lot more. Uh, you had a uh, on that seal. It looked like it was on the. Uh, well, there was. I don't think it was just on the armor. It might have been elsewhere also. But it's, it was on. It the, looks it like it's something the, uh, that's tying them directly to Joseph. Right. It's exactly, exactly right. It's very, tying very them directly to Joseph, yeah. and I love that because it's the this Manasseh and Ephraim. You know, the, these are these are Josephite tribes. And that whole idea of Joseph, if you look for it throughout the Book of Mormon, it's everywhere, you know. And, and so it to is. have that emblem on their chest is, to me, very, uh, very insightful. I, I was very happy to see that. Yeah, they. Um, I've always been observant of even Captain Moroni himself quoting the prophecy mm -hmm. of of Joseph, who was not a prophet, as far as. Prophets are concerned, but we also read that isn't anyone who opens their mouth to testify of Christ a prophet in Abinadi's time, right? They talk about this. So, you know, Joseph, Joseph of Egypt was inspired, even though he wasn't a prophet. He saved Israel. Um, and, um, yeah, they talk of him frequently. They they honored him. They, re they revered him, spoke of him so much in their ties to Egypt. And so, yeah, that's we. so we had the, the, the Nemes. Uh, um, which is, you know, the, the pharaohs, um, mm -hmm. Egyptian. And then you have the feather, which is actually the feather of Ma'at, which mm -hmm. is, it symbolizes liberty and justice. justice and, yeah. and then you've got the two. So this is going to be cool because a lot of people have asked about the symbolism and this movie does not define it. I was hoping we could do that on film too. Um, so you've got the two um, the, uh, vines, right? Mm -hmm. And they start at the bottom, and at the bottom, there's a piece of Joseph's remnant of Joseph's coat at the very bottom of that symbol. It's very small, so you wouldn't have been able to see it unless it was super close up. But there's a there's a piece, a remnant of his coat, that same remnant that uh, Captain Moroni prophesied about, that are we not his seed? Are we not his seed? And are we not been preserved just as the garment was preserved, this piece of his garment? So that garment's at the bottom. And if you remember, that's the very speech that they tore their garments and threw them at Moroni's feet. So that was also extremely symbolic that he was talking about taking a piece of garment, right? So we've got Joseph's garment there, and then we've got the vines that come up. What happens at the top? They intertwine. They kind of come together. They come together, yeah. which is also symbolic of how the Lamanites and the Nephites would come together, which they did when Christ came. And for at least, what, three, two or three generations they were together and then they split again. Yeah. Uh, but the, but the ultimate prophecy and the ultimate hope of every prophet who walked on in ancient America was that the ancient covenant people would return, that they would, um, that they would um, come unto the God of Israel. And, and, and even, even though they would stray and they would dwindle in unbelief as the scriptures say that they would blossom as a rose. And I've gotten um, several emails from Native Americans who um, who believe this, and they said that uh, they're grateful and and looking forward to the day when when they blossom as a rose. And uh, you know, I think the Native Americans' time is is at hand. You know, they've, they've really gotten a, a slight hand all these years, and and of course, in the scriptures we read, well, well, that's it said it was going to happen. You know, it's like, oh well, okay, well, let's change that. And I think the time now is to change that. 
and we we cast real natives in in all the roles that were you know uh, supposed to be native, and uh, we we allowed them to bring a lot of their traditions into their their um, characters into the scenes. In the case of Eugene Brave Rock, we actually used his Blackfoot language, and he was uh, mm -hmm. both honored and and grateful to to have a platform for his language, which is a very uh, it's very uncommon. It, I I've, I don't know that I've ever seen it portrayed in cinema. I'm, I don't portray or uh, pretend to, to have seen every movie on the planet, so I don't know. But um, it's a it's a really beautiful language, and it actually is tied to Algonquin, which which I believe actually, if you look at the Algonquin language, it's very similar to Hebrew. Um, and so I think it was a great language to to use. It feels very ancient. Yeah. The, uh, the seals using the seals on this, and I keep going to this because it's something that I think a lot about. And, uh, I don't know if you've read the book lost 116 pages by Don Bradley, but mm. he, he goes into, uh, uh, the history of the early church, uh, the Latter-day Saints and, and talks about the seals. There are actually seals in the book of Mormon and people don't realize this. They think it's just a, when 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 Moroni says I'm just going to seal this up, he he's not saying he's going to close it up. He's saying he's going to put his seal mm. on the plates, and so he has a seal, just like a king would have a seal for his ring, for example, to put into mm. wax. He has a seal, and he and it and it talks about the descriptions from Charles Anthon and and others that uh, had seen these seals. That was there's one of Moroni. We're mm. told in the introduction of the title page that's written by, I think it's written by Moroni. I can't remember if it's Mormon or Moroni, but it's, you know, Mormon wrote this, but Moroni is sealing this up. And so he has this seal and it has some description to it. It's, it's anyway, it's very interesting. What I really, all another thing that you did that tied together Captain Moroni with Moroni of the seal and the Moroni who's sealing up the plates is you have him quote alma 46 when he's sealing this up that i thought was wonderful also it tied it right back to back to captain moroni about you know this is about our people this is our family this is our wives this is our children our faith and uh that great you know the the great i don't even know what to call it the discourse that that uh um Captain Moroni is giving when he's when he's mm -hmm. when he's ripping the title of liberty for the in front of the Nephites and then going to be battling against Amalekiah and others. So I love that part of it. You pulling those two things together. Yeah, bringing Joseph of the old world, Joseph of the new. Mm. Um, yeah, that was that was the inspiration for that. And you kind of bring up a point there of of quoting the book of mormon and by the way it's not the first time the book of mormon's been quoted in in movies alfred hitchcock quoted like four verses verbatim mm -hmm. from from third nephi nine and family plot uh the book of mormon has um been a very very prominent even if people don't give it credence um it's it's been prominent for a while and we use i don't know probably over a dozen and if you include the deleted scenes you know probably 15 20 times we quoted the book of mormon both in dialogue you don't feel it because it's like it's natural and and most of the times we weren't doing word for word but you know we're kind of adapting it to to a, a dialogue but oh it's there like it's it's almost word for word and if you follow it you, you see it and you hear it um even in um you know the tragic part that you know is in the movie uh, Moroni is literally quoting him, himself and his father um, in his prayer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wherever we could, we, we wanted to include that because it, it brings power uh, into the, into the cinematic environment to, you know, speak those words that are so powerful. And it also makes them human. It makes them come to life. You know, I think it was ain't, ancient Israel with the, the law of Moses. And uh, I found it interesting when I learned that, you know, they would take this lamb and they would actually make it a pet for like a week or so. They would come to love this animal and then they had to sacrifice it. And that's what has to happen. 
in a cinematic environment, it cannot be sanitized because that does not move people. Mm -hmm. There's a place for that, maybe instruction in class, if they just want to, you know, watch someone stand there and quote the scriptures in a costume, you know what I mean? But, you know, if you want someone to feel something, you have to bring that element of drama in and make it personal for them. And so that's essentially what, what we did with the oath. That was our intent was to, was to make it the lamb that you love so that when it's torn away, you feel something and it makes you go, um, you know, how can I be better at keeping my own promises? You know, how can I, be that faithful to the Lord, you know, that I would want to be that person that I, I would be willing to risk my life for something great, you know, for the gathering of Israel, whatever, you know, are we, are we willing to um, give our honor, give our, our, our wealth, give uh, all of our talents and, and, you know, the things that we're supposed to be doing and we make covenants to do, you know, are we really willing to do that? You know, and I, I love the words, you know, that uh, President Nelson said, um, Russell M. Nelson, when he talked about how precious is the Book of Mormon to you, you know, is it is it worth more than rubies? You know, how precious is the Book of Mormon to you? And uh, I mean, for 13 years, you know, we've my family and I have have literally trudged through this journey, and it's been challenging. And there were so many times that, boy. It would have been easy and it would have been, you know, at least in, in the situation, it seemed almost better to just let it go and move on. And uh, that's what kept us going. Like, how precious is the Book of Mormon to me? Well, as far as me and my life, you know, and, and, and there, you know, some, some members of the church, the ones on that, you know, one star spectrum, right? There are a few there. Um, I would just say, you know, until you have done something at at that level of consecration, uh, I would I would uh, I would drop that stone if I were you, because there's one thing I've learned in life. You know, you have to walk in somebody's shoes before you can judge them, and um, the reason that I've kept going in this for so long is because I, I love the Book of Mormon and um, and because the Book of Mormon saved my life, you know, uh, what does that mean? Well, um, people ask, my, my father passed away um, a week before my 17th birthday. And had I not started reading the Book of Mormon intently a year before his passing, um, that probably would have destroyed me. And, but instead of destroying me, it, it was like the force in, in, in Star Wars. It's like it made me stronger. It made me a man at 17. You know, I had to really get my priorities straight. And thankfully, a year before that is when I had that dramatic spiritual change in my life. And so, you know, people can cast stones at me, they can cast stones at the Book of Mormon because because it's one of two camps. It's it's the the myopic, Pharisaical, you know, blinder view that nothing can be different than what I think it needs to be, and then there's also the camp of just religious bigots that literally just they just bigoted against um, goodness, and specifically against the Book of Mormon. I'm like, sure, throw stones at it, but I can tell you, I, all I can give you is my experience. And my experience is that book gave me so much. And, and not that it, like the Bible didn't. I, I we read the Bible too. It's just that that book had a special meaning to me uh, because I, I I really, you know, read it with intent. And it, it gave me power beyond my abilities to be able to handle that tragic event in my life. And uh, so that's all I can give people is my experience about it. So, you know, people can say, oh, the Book of Mormon's a fraud. It was made up, Joseph Smith. You know, I, I love the evolution of how they tried to, you know, Spalding, they tried to, you know, make it so he was a plagiarist. And then they said, no, no, it's not that. It's he's he's just, he's a brilliant mind that he just made this up. And how he could do that, I don't know, but he was possessed by the devil and that's how he did it. You know, they, they've gone from all these ways of trying to, you know, they either have to give him no respect or they have to give him all the respect in the world and say he's one of the most brilliant minds ever because he, he invented this book. As long as it doesn't have God involved with it. 
exactly. It doesn't have God involved. And, and to, to me, I always say, I always say this, I'm like, what is so controversial about the mere idea that Jesus Christ visited the ancient American continent after his resurrection? What is so controversial about this? Doesn't this, it, I mean, people should want to believe that. They should want to believe that because it says that he is a God of all the earth and that he, he loves all of his children everywhere. I mean, it's just, it just blows my mind that, that uh, pe people close it off so easily, most of the time without even ever cracking a page open and reading it. And so, you know, that's what drove me along this path. And, um, you know, we, 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 we gave it our, our absolute best with this movie. It is not perfect. No movie is perfect. Uh, but boy, we stand by it. And everyone, everyone who um, took part in making it, we stand by it. Uh, and it is a, it's a good movie with a great message. And the spirit of the Book of Mormon is, is so powerful in it. And uh, really hope people go, go check it out before it gets out of theaters. We will release digitally um, next year, about probably end of March. It'll be available worldwide. Uh, we've got people in Australia, UK, Canada. They're mad at us that we we didn't put it in theaters there. It's just, we only did what we could do, you know? Well, you know, I, I love the movie. It was a lot of fun to watch. Again, the realistic approach to this. I love the fresh take on it because it's just, it, it, it requires a lot of thought. You're not just following a robotic sequence of events. And I think that's really important for people to see sometimes. Yeah. So really enjoyed that, the humanizing of, of Moroni. We talked about it earlier in the interview, but where can people go to get tickets and see where they can uh, see the film? Oathmovie.com, oathmovie.com. And I say this in every interview, don't do me any favors. Go go to oathmovie.com. You can watch the, the trailer uh, as well, well as the message from me, the director that follows after the trailer. And then there's also a, a bunch of audience reactions that you can, you can look at. And these are not people that we paid. Uh, these are people that were randomly just kind of grabbed after they walked out of the movie. And you can tell when you watch them that they're not, you know, that they're authentic. So these are real feelings from real people. And one of the most frequently said things is they feel like I want to be a better person when they leave. Mm -hmm. Like, isn't that the kind of movie we want to watch? Like, I want to, you want, you want to feel like you want to be a better person? Go see The Oath. Uh, if you're having a faith crisis, go see The Oath. Some of our best reactions have been from people who have left the church or are struggling with their faith in some way. And even some, you know, in the mainstream Christian world. Um, it, it, and I think it's because they go into it, you know, not with an expectation. They're, they're going in to watch a movie about goodness, and it happens to be set in this ancient American time and be inspired by you know, an ancient book that they don't believe in necessarily. But um, it's it's been fascinating to see that. Um, and I think in, in, indicating of, of, you know, the type of experience that people can expect to have, you know, and somebody's struggled with their faith for whatever reason, and they're touched and moved. You know, I had one gentleman say, I, I haven't read the Book of Mormon in 10 years. Like, I, I want to read it again. You know, not going to church, but isn't it worth it? Like, one, if one person decides to go crack open the book and learn about Jesus Christ visiting America, I mean, to me, that's worth it. And and again, with uh, with our high audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, it's, it's very apparent that most people that see it are liking it. You really don't have anything to lose. Go check it out. Darren, appreciate that. And I would give the same invitation to everyone. Go check out the movie. I think you'll really enjoy it. Appreciate you coming on, Darren. I'd, I'd love to talk to you again sometime. Let's do it, man. Sounds All good. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks. Take care, man.